Will you turn in your Bibles to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and to chapter 21, which is our passage for today as we continue our studies in the life of Abraham. Genesis chapter 21. Let us hear the word of God. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age? The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Sarah was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do, you, do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift, up, lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me in the country where you are living as an alien the same kindness I have shown to you. Abram said, I swear it. Then Abram complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who, did, who has done this. You did not tell me, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a treaty. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs you have set apart by themselves? He replied, Accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that place was called Beersheba because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, 
Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the Eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. God will bless to us that reading of his word. Genesis chapter 21 marks a pivotal point in the outworking of God's plans for Abraham. Indeed, for the world. Here, in the birth of Abraham's son Isaac, we have the second great step towards the fulfillment of this plan of God. God's plan, you see, was to have a people of his own, separate from the surrounding nations, a people who would be devoted to him and who would live by his word, a people to whom the Savior should be born, a people who would become his means of blessing the whole earth. First step to the realization of that plan had been the call of Abraham to be the father of this great nation and his going to the land that God showed him. The second step was the birth of Isaac. But notice that it took 30 years or so to happen. 30 years during which Abraham had journeyed around Canaan, had seen his nephew leave and make a mess of his life, had made his own mistakes. And yet 30 years which God was reassuring him at times, God was silent at other times. 30 years waiting. And you know what it's like to wait, don't you? A few months, let alone 30 years. Does that remind us that God is never in a hurry? God has his time, and he waits until he acts. He waits his time. He's every reason for waiting. I'm sure Abraham, maybe although he didn't know it himself, had learned so much during those days of waiting. Remember that sometimes the Lord answers our prayers with wait. And when he does, he has wise purposes in those delays. Notice, too, that although this was such an important event in the outworking of God's plan for mankind, it all was so ordinary and unspectacular. What I mean is no one, no one out with the immediate household would know much about it. It was unusual, of course, and the parents were so old. But it happened so quietly, didn't it? It wasn't the sort of thing that hit the headlines of the Herald or the six o'clock news. But again, isn't that often the way God works? Yes, there may be great advances in science and technology and there may be great disasters in many people's lives, great upheavals in the world of politics, great convulsions in nature. But it isn't usually in these ways, that God brings about the advances of his kingdom. It's usually in his dealings in the lives of individuals. Through the sowing of the seed of the word that quietly penetrates and, and, and germinates and grows. Through the quiet and yet decisive working of his spirit, bringing individuals to new birth. Think for the example, think of the coming of the Savior himself. Just to an ordinary couple, to a cattle shed in Bethlehem, unnoticed by the vast majority of folk. Well, don't be too concerned that the church 
that Jesus Christ doesn't hit the headlines. Nothing spectacular seems to be happening. Don't be taken in with all these statistics of church decline. It only takes, it only takes the birth of one child. The birth of one Christian believer. And the whole of history can be changed. Well, we're here to look at chapter 21. Let's do that. Chapter 21. There are two, there are two themes that I want simply to highlight this morning. First is the grace of God, and the second is the faith of Abraham. First, the grace of God. Just look with me at the way the chapter begins. If we were writing this story, I guess we'd have begun with verse 2. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham, wouldn't we? Look where the writer begins in verse 1. Now the Lord, capital letters, the covenant, the covenant God, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. The Lord acted in grace towards Sarah. Now we all know that grace in the Bible is God's undeserved favor or kindness. What someone has said, grace is God making sure we get what we don't deserve. You see, we need to be straight on this. Sarah and Abraham didn't deserve a child, did they? This wasn't their reward for leaving their home and their family 30 years previously and living all this time in tents. This wasn't their reward for living a good life and being true to God all these years. In fact, in just the preceding chapter we saw just months before the child was born how Abraham faithlessly went off and lied about his wife. A year previously, Sarah herself had laughed in sheer disbelief when she was told she was going to have a child. No, no, they didn't deserve. They didn't deserve a son any more than any of, any of us. The gift of a son and the associated joy was evidence of the grace of God to them. And that reminds us that everything we have, everything, comes from God. The gift of salvation in Jesus Christ is a gift of God's grace, his undeserved kindness. We don't deserve anything from God except punishment for our sins. But in sheer grace, God has come to us in Jesus and he gives us forgiveness and he gives us new life and salvation and the hope of heaven. And we need to be reminded about that. We often, so often think we must earn our salvation. And that coming to church and giving generously to the harvest offering and being kind to others, and then God is bound to accept us. Not a bit of it. We're not in the business of stacking up merit points. We'd never have enough. No, God in sheer grace. Not because we deserve it gives us salvation and we need to stop trying to earn it and start trusting Christ and living this salvation out. Notice what the text actually says here. It doesn't say that the Lord was gracious by giving Sarah and Abraham a child and making them happy, although that was true. It says, the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. You see, it links God's graciousness to the fulfillment of his word and his promises. Even to the timing of the fulfillment. God was being gracious by keeping his word. Now remember... God's word and promise was all that Abraham and Sarah had. 
They'd been promised the land and they didn't own a square meter of it. They'd been told they'd become a great nation and for 30 years they didn't have a child of their own and the likelihood of them having children was remote to say the least. But now in grace God has kept his word and they had a son of their own. What God had promised had happened. And I can't but wonder if some of their joy and their laughter that day wasn't wasn't just that they got what they wanted but that here in this child was the very first proof of the truth of God's word. You see, yeah, they'd prospered, but lots of other people had prospered. For 30 years, there'd been no proof. All they had was God's word. And now after this long, long wait, God in grace gives them the evidence of sight. Because God had spoken what to others was a freak biological happening became for them a miracle witnessing to the truth of God's word. God in his grace gave them what he promised. God kept his word and gave them living proof of the truth and the trustworthiness of his word. You see, many today, many today want proof before they'll believe. That's not God's way. If it was, we'd never, we'd never be satisfied. We'd always be wanting more proof. Like the people in Jesus' day who wanted more and more and more miracles. No, we believe in the bare word of God. And then later, in his grace, he may well give us proof of the truth of that word. In grace, God was keeping his word and giving this couple a child and much joy. Friends, we have the same God, the God of grace today. He doesn't deal with us as we deserve. He deals with us by keeping his word to us. God's made promises in his word of a saviour who'll come and deal with our sin by his death. And he's kept that word. He's made promise that whoever comes to Christ in repentance will be received. He's promised never to leave us or forsake us, those who trust in him. He's promised the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to those who trust him. He's promised us a place in heaven, salvation, from the guilt and the power and the very presence of sin. And in grace he will keep these promises and he'll make our joy full. As we go on in the Christian life and begin to experience the fulfillment of some of these promises, we say them as proofs of the truth and the trustworthiness of God's word. Oh, that we could, oh, that we could grasp something of that this morning, something of the graciousness of our God. He wants to bless us. He wants to make our joy full. Why do we doubt him? Or that we'd be able to say to say with Sarah in verse 7, who would have said this or that? And yet, I've done it. Because God has been gracious to me. Well, we look to the grace of God. Let's think for a few minutes about the faith of Abraham in this chapter. Because I believe that his faith was expanded and strengthened by what happened here in this in this chapter in three ways. First of all, notice notice Abraham's growing faith in the way that he obeyed the Lord's instructions. The previous year, when the Lord had appeared to Abraham after those 13 years of silence, and the Lord had renewed his covenant with him, the Lord had told him that Sarah would bear him a son, and his name was to be Isaac. 
chapter 17, verse 19. Well, Abraham didn't forget that. Notice, as soon as the child was born, Abraham gave him the name Isaac. Now, they may not have liked that name. We don't know. The name Isaac means he laughs. It may have reminded Abraham of the way he'd laughed when the Lord told him that Sarah was going to have a, a son. But whatever, whatever he felt about the name, he gave it to the child because that was what God said his name was to be. And also, that time a year previously, the Lord had told Abraham to circumcise every male eight days old and over as a sign of the covenant a permanent mark on their body that would be a reminder of their relationship with God. And Abraham, that very day, a year previously, had done that. He'd circumcised the males in his family. Now, a year later, in all the excitement of Isaac's birth, when it would have been so easy to forget, when it would have been so easy to argue, well, this is a... This is a painful thing to do to an eight-year-old boy. Abraham did it. He did it. Verse 4. You see, the covenant, the covenant with God meant everything to Abraham now. And he was willing to obey the Lord even when he didn't understand everything about it. The Lord had graciously kept his word and so Abraham must keep his. And the child must be counted in on the covenant blessings. It was an act of faith to mark the child out as God's child. Abraham's growing faith is marked by obedience to God's commands. And a growing faith in us will make us more and more careful to want all that God wants for us and therefore more and more careful to do God's will as revealed in his word. You are my friend, said Jesus, as you do as I command you. Secondly, we see Abraham's growing faith in the way he put away part of his old life. Verses 8 to 21. It's the day when they're celebrating Isaac being weaned. He's probably two or three years old by then. The Lord had kept him over these months and years. He'd grown up, he was healthy, and now they're having a party. Everyone was happy until, until Sarah sees Ishmael, Abraham's other son by Hagar, now probably about 15 years old, mocking and teasing Isaac. And Sarah was furious. She tells Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. I wonder if she sees in, Isaac, in, in Ishmael a reminder of her own stupidity. After all, it was her idea, wasn't it? that Abraham have a child by Hagar. Is she, is she venting her rage on herself? Maybe. Ah, but there's more to it than that. Look at verse 12. Verse 12, we discover that the Lord approved. The Lord approved of Sarah's demand. You see, it seems that as Sarah watched these two boys playing, the truth came to her. She suddenly sees these two boys as products of two completely incompatible outlooks and, and ways of going about life and trying to serve God. Two ways. Isaac, beyond doubt, is the product of waiting upon God and upon the word of God and the way of faith. 
Ishmael is the product of an entirely different way. The way she and her husband had taken. The way of human wisdom. The way of confidence in what the New Testament calls the flesh. Fallen, sinful, self-centered human will. And she sees that these two ways can never mix. They're completely opposed to each other. Ishmael stands there threatening everything that's of God and of grace. And she has no hesitation. Get rid of him and her mother. Abraham, can't you see it? Make up your mind once and forever about this Hagar affair. Get rid of her. Make a complete break with your sinful past. That's what God approved of. It was only through the God-given child that God's promised blessing would come. But Oh, this was so hard for Abraham, wasn't it? It was his child. He prayed for this child. He couldn't see how this could be for the best. But the Lord told him to do it. And early the next morning, without further delay, he sent him off. And we discover in the story how the Lord looked after the boy and his mother in a wonderful way. Just as he said. Now it's very interesting how Paul takes that incident up in Galatians chapter 4 and applies it to the Jews, Gentiles of his day. And that's something you can look at in your house groups on Wednesday. Okay, There isn't time now. The point here is The point here is, Abraham had to get rid of this evidence of past failure and sin, costly as it may be. And it was part of his growing faith, an indication that God and his way was now the only way for him, that he did it. If we are going to go on with the Lord, if our faith is going to grow, there will be things that we'll have to give up. Things that maybe happened years ago. Old habits, old mistakes. Something that we maybe took into our own hands and decided for ourselves. It'll have to go. Costly as it may be. Paul says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things. Abraham's growing faith is seen in the stand that he took, getting rid of the results of his past failure and sin. And thirdly, Abraham's growing faith is seen in his attitude to outsiders. Verses 22 to 34. His attitude to outsiders. Abimelech, we met him last week in chapter 20. Abimelech wants to make a peace treaty with Abraham. And so after sorting out some difficulties about a well, very important in those days of course, the two men come to an agreement. Now notice, notice here that Abraham isn't too friendly. Oh, he's polite and he keeps his promises, but he isn't going to get too involved with outsiders. Instead, we read of him planting a tree and calling on the name of the Lord, the eternal God. See, he's got a new name for God. He's got a new understanding of God now, the eternal, without beginning or ending. And what's the significance of a tree? Well, wouldn't this be somewhere to come to remind himself and his family in future of the graciousness of God? Remember before he'd build altars. Now he plants a tree. He's making his mark for God. He wasn't ashamed to be seen worshipping the Lord who'd done so much for him. It's a sign of our growing faith when we're 
content not to get involved in the affairs of pagan, godless men and women around us. Oh, we'll be polite and friendly, yes. But it's far more important to us to be in God's house, calling on the name of the Lord, discovering for ourselves new truths about him. Today we're going to bring nine folks into membership in our church. Three of them have come to a living faith in Christ recently and are making this public profession for the first time. Our chapter this morning reminds us that all of us, these three, these nine, all of us, whether we've been Christians five months or 50 years, all of us have become Christians because our Lord is gracious and has done what he promised. We don't deserve salvation. We aren't better than anybody else. It's simply that the Lord has been gracious to us and has kept his promise to us. And we've simply received the gift of his grace. And our chapter this morning reminds all of us, not just our new members, that all of us, like Abraham, must be responding to that grace with a growing faith. And that growing faith will be seen as it was seen with Abraham. It will be seen as we obey, as we do what the Lord tells us in his word. It will be seen as we face up to our past mistakes and get rid of the evidences of the old fallen nature. It will be seen as we take our stand for God in the world. Don't get involved with outsiders. Make our mark for God. We aren't ashamed of coming to worship, of speaking about our Lord, of staying in the place where the Lord has placed us for as long as he tells us. As our friends take their vows of membership today, they're saying, they're saying the first vow, I'm a Christian. I believe in the Christian God. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. All because the Lord is gracious. And they're saying the next four vows, I want to keep growing in that faith like Abraham did. If you're a church member, why not reaffirm your vows with our friends this morning. If you're not a church member, why aren't you? Have you not accepted the gift of grace yet? Let's sing hymn number 869. 869, and as we sing this hymn, our new members could come to the front and our elders too can come and join them. 869, all the way, my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside?